Covering Big Data Silicon Valley 2017. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are live at the historic Pagoda Lounge in San Jose for Big Data SV, which is associated with Strata Hadoop World across the street, as well as Big Data Week. So everything Big Data is happening in San Jose. We're happy to be here. Love the new venue. Uh, if you're around, stop by back of the Fairmont, the Pagoda. Lounge. We're excited to be joining this next segment by what's now become a regular. Uh, anytime we're at a big data event, a Spark event, Holden always stops by. Holden Carroll, she's the principal software engineer at IBM. Holden, great to see you. Thank you. It's it's wonderful to be back yet again. Absolutely. So the big data meme just keeps rolling. Uh, Google Cloud Next was last week. A lot of talk about AI and ML, and of course you're very involved in in Spark. So yeah. what are you excited about these days? What are you? I'm sure you've got a couple of presentations sure. going on across the street. Yeah, um, so my, my two presentations this week, uh, oh wow, I should remember them. So the one that I'm doing today is with my coworker Seth Hendrickson, also at IBM, um, and we're going to be focused on how to use structured streaming for machine learning. Um, and sort of, I think that's really interesting because streaming machine learning is, is something a lot of people seem to want to do, but aren't yet doing in production, so it's always fun to talk to people before they've built their systems. Uh, and then tomorrow I'm going to be talking with Joey on how to debug Spark, um, which is something that I, you know, a lot of people ask questions about, but I tend to not talk about because it tends to scare people away. Um, and so, you know, I, I try and keep the happy, happy going. But bugs are never fun. No, no, never fun. Um, um, ju just picking up on that uh, structured streaming and machine learning. Yeah. Um, so there's there's this issue of um, as we move more and more towards. In industrial Internet of Things, like having to process events as you know they come in, make a decision. Right. Um, how there's a range of latency that's required. Totally. Where does where does structured streaming and ML fit t today, and where might that go? So structured streaming for today, latency wise, is um, probably not something I would use for something like that right now. Um, it's in the like sub second range. Um, which is nice, but it's not what you want for like live serving of like decisions for your car, right? Like that's that's just not going to be feasible. Um, but I, I think it certainly has the potential to get a lot faster. Um, we've seen a lot of renewed interest in ML Live Local, um, which is really about making it so that we can take the models that we've trained in Spark and really push them out to the edge and sort of serve them in the edge and, and apply our models on like end devices. Um, and so I'm really excited about where that's going. Um, to be fair, part of my excitement is someone else is doing that work, so I'm very excited that they're, that they're doing this work for me. Let me clarify on that just to make sure I understand. So there's, there's a lot of overhead in Spark because it runs on a cluster, because yeah. you have an optimizer, because you have the you know, high availability or, or the resilience. Yeah. And so you're saying we can preserve the predict and maybe serve part yeah. and carve out all the other overhead for running in a very small environment. Right, yeah, so I think for a lot of these IoT devices and stuff like that, it, it actually makes a lot more sense to do the predictions on the device itself, right? These models generally are megabytes in size and we don't need a cluster to do predictions on these models, right? We really need the cluster to train them, um, but for a lot of cases, I think pushing the prediction out to the edge node is actually a pretty reasonable use case. Um, and so I'm really excited that we've got some, some work going on there. Um, taking that one step further, we've talked to a bunch of people, um, both uh, like at GE and yeah. at their Minds and Ma Machines show and IBM's uh, Genius of Things, where you want to be able to train the models up in the cloud where mm -hmm. you're getting data from all the different devices yeah. and then push the retrained model out to the edge. Yeah. Has, can that happen in Spark or do we have to have something else orchestrating all that? Um, so, so actually pushing the model out isn't something that I would do in Spark itself. Um, I think that's, that's better served by other tools. Um, Spark, is, is not really well suited to, to large amounts of internet traffic, right? But it's really well suited to the training, and I think um, with MLlib Local, it's, it'll essentially, we'll be able to provide both sides of it, and, and the copy part will be left up to whoever it is that's, that's doing their work, right? Because like, 
if you're copying over a cell network, you need to do something very different as if you're like broadcasting over a terrestrial like XM or something like that. You, you need to do something very different for satellite. If you're, if you're at the edge on a device, yeah. would you be actually running like you're saying earlier structured streaming with the with the prediction could, right could I don't do think that? you would use structured streaming per se on the edge device but you would use um, so essentially there would be a lot of code shared between structured streaming and the code that you'd be using on the edge device and it's, it's being factored out now so that we can we can have this code sharing in spark machine learning um, and you would you use structured streaming maybe on the training side and then on the serving side you would use your your custom local code okay so um, tell us a little more about Spark ML uh, today and how we can democratize sure. machine learning you know, for bigger, bigger audience. Right, I, I think machine learning is great, um, but right now you really need a, a strong statistical background to, to really be able to apply it effectively. Um, and we probably can't get rid of that for, for all problems, but I think for a lot of problems, um, doing things like hyperparameter tuning can actually give really powerful tools to just like regular engineering folks who they're smart but they maybe you know they don't have a strong machine learning background um, and sparks ml pipelines make it really easy to sort of construct um, multiple stages and then just be like okay I don't know what these parameters should be I want you to do a search over what these different parameters could be for me and it, it makes it really easy to do this as just a regular engineer with less of an ml background um, would that be like um, just for those of us who are, you know, who haven't no who don't know what hyperparameter tuning is. Oh, okay, is sure. The, so the we, knobs, we we the can variables. think of it. Yeah, it's going to spin the knobs on like our regularization parameter on like our our regression, and it could also like spin some knobs on like maybe the n-gram sizes that we were using on the inputs to to something else, right? And so it can compare how these knobs sort of interact with each other, because often, you know, you can tune one knob, but you, you actually have like six different knobs that you want to tune and you don't know if you just explore each one individually you're not going to find the, the best setting for them working together. So this would make it easier for as uh, you're saying someone who's not a data scientist to set up um, a pipeline that lets you predict. I, I think so very much. Um, it's it I think it does a, a lot of the brings a lot of the benefits from sort of the SciPy world to the big data world. Um, and SciPy is, is really wonderful about making machine learning really accessible, but it's just not, you know, ready for, for big data. And I, I think this does a good job of bringing these same concepts, if not the code, but the same concepts to big data. The SciPy, if I understand, if I, um, is it a notebook that would run essentially on one machine? You, you SciPy can be put in a notebook environment, and generally it would run on, yeah, a single machine. And so to make that uh, sit on Spark means you could then run it on a cluster for doing yeah. your... Yeah, so, so this, this isn't actually taking SciPy and distributing it. This is just like stealing the good concepts from SciPy uh, and okay. making them available for big data people. Okay. Um, because SciPy has done a really good job of making a very intuitive machine learning sort of interface. So just to uh, put a fine sort of uh, uh, qualifier on one thing, if you're doing the Internet of Things and you have Spark at the edge and you're, you're running the, the model there, yeah. um, it's the programming model. Um, so it, it's structured streaming is one way of programming Spark. Totally. But if you don't have structured streaming at the edge, would you just be using the core batch Spark programming model? So um, at the edge, you'd just be using, you, you wouldn't even be using batch, right? Because you're trying to predict on individual events, right? Okay. So you'd just be calling predict with every new event that you're getting in. Um, and you, you might have a queue mechanism of some type. Um, but essentially, if, if we had this batch, we would, we would be adding additional latency. And, and I think at the edge, we, we really, the reason we're moving the models to the edge the is latency. to avoid the latency. Right, right. So um, just to be clear then, is the programming model so it wouldn't be structured streaming and we're 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 taking out all the overhead that forced us to use batch with spark yeah. so the the reason i'm i'm trying to clarify is a lot of people had this question for a long time which is are we going to have a different programming model at the edge from right. what we have at the center yeah that's a great question um and i don't think the answer is finished yet but i think the work is being done to try and make it look the same um of course, you know, 
trying to make it look the same. This is Boo. She's not like actually barking at us right now, even though she looks like a dog. And she is. Um, but you know, there will always be things which are a little bit different from the edge to your cluster. But I think Spark has done a really good job of of making things look very similar on single node cases to multi node cases. And I, I think we can probably bring the same things to ML. Okay, so it's almost like we're coming back. Spark was took us from single machine to cluster, yeah. and now we have to essentially bring it back for an edge device that's really lightweight. Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, just from a latency point of view, that's what we have to do for serving. For some models, not for not for everyone, right? Like if you're building a website with a recommendation system, you don't need to serve that model like on the edge node, that's fine. But like if you've got a car device, we can't depend on like cell latency, right? You have to serve that in car. Right. So um, what are some of the things, some of the other things that IBM is contributing to the, to the ecosystem that you see um, having a big impact over the next couple of years? So there's, there's a lot of really exciting things coming out of IBM. Um, and I'm obviously pretty biased. I spent a lot of time focused on Python support in Spark. Um, and one of the most exciting things is coming from my coworker, Brian. Uh, called, uh, I'm not going to say his last name in case I get it wrong. Um, but Brian is amazing. And he's been working on uh, integrating Arrow with Spark. And this can make it so that it's going to be a lot easier to sort of um, interoperate between JVM languages and Python and R. And so I'm really optimistic about sort of the Python and R interfaces improving a lot in, in Spark and getting a lot faster as well. Um, and, and we're also, in addition to the arrow work, we've got some work around making it a lot easier for people in R and Python to get started. Um, the R stuff is, is mostly actually the Microsoft people. Thanks, Felix. You're awesome. Um, I don't actually know which camera I should have done that to, but that's okay. <laughs> that's perfect. I think you got it. Um, <laughs> I think you got it. Cool. So Felix is amazing, and, and the other people working on R are too. Um, but I think we're, we've both been pursuing sort of making it so that people who are in the R or Python spaces can just use like pip install, conda install, or whatever tool it is they're used to working with to just bring Spark into their machine really easily, just like they would any other sort of software package that they're using. Because right now, for someone getting started in Spark, um, if you're in the Java space, it's pretty easy. But if you're in R or Python, you, you have to do a lot of sort of weird setup work. And it's worth it. But like, if we can get rid of that friction, I think we can get a lot more people in these communities using Spark. Let me see if I, just as a scenario, sure. the R server is getting fairly well integrated into SQL Server. Yeah. So would it be, would you be able to use R as the language um, with the Spark execution engine sort of so to somehow integrate it into SQL Server as a execution engine for doing the machine learning and predicting? You definitely, well, I shouldn't say definitely. You probably could do that. Um, I don't necessarily know if that's a good idea, but that's the kind of stuff that this would enable, right? Okay. It'll make it so that um, people that are making tools in R or Python can just use Spark as another library, right? And it doesn't have to be this really special setup. Um, it can just be this library, and they point out the cluster, and it can do whatever work it wants to do. That being said, the SQL Server R integration, if you find yourself using that to do like distributed computing, you should probably take a step back and like rethink what you're doing. Because it's not really scale out. It's, it's not really set up for that. Um, and, and you might be better off doing this with like a you know, ha connecting your Spark cluster to your SQL Server instance using like JDBC or a special driver and, and doing it that way. But you you definitely could do it in, in another inverted sort of way. So last question from me. If you look out, um, if you look out a couple years, um, how will we make machine learning accessible to a bigger and bigger audience? Um, and I know you touched on the yeah. the tuning of the knobs, hyperparameter tuning. What 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 will it look like ultimately? I, I think ML pipelines are probably what things are going to end up looking like. Um, but I think the other part that we'll sort of see is we'll see a lot more examples with how to work with certain kinds of data, um, because right now, like I know what I need to do when I'm ingesting some textual data. But I know that because I spent like a week trying to figure out what the hell I was doing once, right? Um, and I didn't bother to write it down. And it looks like no one else bothered to write it down, right? 
Um, so I, I think really we'll see a lot of tools that look very similar to the tools we have today. Um, they'll have more options and they'll, they'll be a bit easier to use. But I think the main thing that we're really lacking right now is good documentation and sort of good books and, and just good resources for people to figure out how to use these tools. Um, now, of course, I mean, I'm biased because I work on these tools. So I'm like, yeah, they're pretty great. Um, so th there might be other people who are like, Holden, no, you're wrong. We need to rethink everything. Um, but, but I think this is, you know, we're, we can go very far with the pipeline concept. And then that's good, right? The democratization of these things opens it up to more people. You get more creative people solving more different problems. Yeah. And that, that makes the whole thing go. You can, like, install Spark easily. You can, you know, set up a ML pipeline. You can train your model. You can start doing predictions. You can, like, people that just haven't been able to do machine learning at scale can, can get started super easily and, and build a recommendation system for their, you know, small little online shop and be like, Hey, you bought this. You might want to also buy Boo. She is really cute. But you can't have this Boo's one. Boo's not for sale, though. No, no, no. Not this one. Come on. No. It's a tease. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, hold on. Well, that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll say bye-bye for now. I'm sure we will see you in June in San Francisco at, yeah. uh, at Spark Summit. And uh, look forward to the update. I look forward to chatting with you then. Yeah, Thanks absolutely. So much. And uh, break a leg this afternoon at your, uh, at your uh, presentation. Thank you. She's holding the carrot. Caro, I'm Jeff Frick. He's George Gilbert. You're watching The Cube. We're at Big Data SV. Thanks for watching. Stop.